Hello, welcome everybody. Oh, they fix the sound. Great. So welcome to the Dart a Modern Web Language presentation. This is the first ever presentation about Dart at Google I.O. And uh, I'm here, I'm Lars Bach, with Kasper Lund, coming all the way from Denmark to present Dart. Um, I can just say it right away. We will not be doing any base jumping, nor sky <laughs> or stage diving. This will be fairly boring in that respect. Um, but what I can tell you about is about this new programming language we, are, we have been working on for a year. And this presentation will include a few things. We'll talk about the motivation for it. Uh, and part of the motivation is our uh, work on V8. Casper uh, and I have been working on V8 for, for many years, I guess. Four, four or so? Four years, yeah. Four years. And um, some of the experience with JavaScript has led us to Dart. We'll be talking about the basic language. We'll be talking about uh, the project and some of the components we have in the Dart project. And then we'll talk about the bright future we hopefully have with Dart. So let's get starting. We have a lot of uh, interesting stuff to talk about. So um, our background is implementing virtual machines. And uh, as you probably can see, I'm the oldest one. Uh, he's a younger version. Uh, I've been doing VMs for 26 years. Casper has been doing it for the last 12. We worked together on many projects. Uh, we've been doing Java virtual machines, uh, also JavaScript engines like V8, and um, that's been pretty cool. So this is our first project ever where we've been uh, designing a programming language. Kasper? Yeah, before, uh, before I joined Lars on this mission to try to improve uh, the performance of, of virtual machines um, in var for various languages, Lars was working on more exotic languages too, like the beta programming language or a sort of Scandinavian object-oriented language. So there's a lot of uh, experience on the stage here, like nearly 40 years combined. Um, so we, we certainly know a thing or two about um, virtual machines. So hopefully we can convince you that we know a thing or two about languages as well. So first of all, there'll be a, a little bit of a salute to the web. We think the web is fantastic. Uh, the web is everywhere today. You have it on your mobile phone, your, your, your pads, and your desktop. So when you do an application, you can actually cover most devices today. It's also very easy to use as a developer. You can just pop into the, your favorite text editor, type in a few lines, and then you can start it up in your browser. There's no tool chain involved in getting the program up running. And one thing I really like about the web there's no required installation of the app. Whenever you, you start Gmail, you'll get the newest version. So you are not bothered by these uh, updates. I assume you all have mobile phones. Have you tried to get bothered by an update notification? I guess. Um, for me, at least, uh, that's one of the benefits of the web, that you don't have to install uh, an application. Uh, furthermore, it's also a very incremental experience to develop for the web, right? You can change one line uh, in the program and you say refresh. So within uh, a second, you can have your application up running again. And that's very appealing when you do prototype development and so on. And one thing that's even better, uh, the browser industry uh, is right now fairly competitive. All the browser vendors, they're competing on speed and functionality. And most implementation are open source. So it's a friendly competition. Here's my best attempt to make a wheel. It turned out to be three-sided. Uh, but I'm trying to explain the ecosystem of uh, browser development. When you add more performance into a browser, you will sort of enable application developers to innovate. They can add more functionality on the client side. And that, again, will require new browser features, and so on and so forth. And this is great, because whenever you take a turn with this wheel, the browser will be a better place to develop, develop application and also use applications. Here's a JavaScript performance improvement chart. It will show you the speed up of JavaScript the last 12 years. And as you can see, that was a dry spell of a number of years. And uh, then we introduced in 2008 Chrome, the beta version, where V8 was part of that. Um, 
And you can see since 2008, the performance of JavaScript, JavaScript has just improved tremendously. In fact, JavaScript is now 100 times faster on the same hardware compared to a browser five years ago. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? That's a lot, yeah. Even on mobile devices, uh, like an Android device, uh, you can see that the performance of JavaScript is comparable uh, to a desktop machine when we introduced uh, V8 in 2008. So this is pretty amazing, and it really allows you guys to do better apps uh, on the web. We've already seen a few things that have come along that, that take advantage of this, um, this new uh, power. Uh, so the, the point with the previous slide where uh, performance improvements of the core platform really helps you innovate uh, can be seen in, in uh, one of the latest versions of the, the Google Maps, for instance, where you can enable uh, client-side rendering of, of, of things. Things that you had to do on the server side before is now possible to do on the client instead, which is pretty cool. Um, so we certainly see that this is already now helping a lot on, on what you can do and achieve with, with the web. So during this period, the web applications have become more and more complex. And uh, that poses some challenges for the web. Right. What we really want, we want to have better uh, programmer productivity. And uh, we also want application scalability so that as you get bigger and bigger applications, the uh, browser can cope with it as you execute it. And then, of course, you need raw execution speed. We fixed some of that with V8, but we are not uh, hitting the glass ceiling yet. One thing that's a problem today, at least from my point of view, is that startup performance is not where we want it to be. When you start up a big web app, it's still fairly slow. For instance, if you take a Gmail, you have to read in a lot of source code before you can start the application. And that sort of delays the startup with a half to a full second. So the, the, the final item on this slide here is that if we don't innovate, right, the web will sort of lose out to, the, to mobile apps where they can install a more native type of uh, applications. Fortunately, we have a solution for you. We have the Dart platform. And uh, this is, pr this is a, a suite of technologies that will hopefully uh, solve some of these issues with the existing platform. Our high-level goals uh, are fairly simple. We want to make a simple, productive programming environment and programming language that supports for programming in the large. And we also want to have predictable, high performance. And that means that when you write your code, you can sort of expect some sort of performance. Right now, it's complicated with JavaScript. It often depends on what the browser optimizes, how good performance you get out of it. We want to have ultra-fast startup. Things that takes more than a hundred of milliseconds uh, is just unacceptable. And then, of course, uh, we are not out to break the web. We really want to have compatibility with all modern browsers. And we'll show you how we've done that in Dart by providing a translator from Dart to JavaScript. So let's talk about JavaScript. Let's do that. So I, I don't know how many people in here are familiar with JavaScript. <laughs> there are some that know it. OK, that's good. Um, how many people here actually work with JavaScript every day? Good crowd. I like that. So um, hopefully you're aware of uh, some fundamental issues with JavaScript. And we're going to run through a few of them uh, just to give you a, a feel for the kind of issues we're trying to tackle. So one big issue we see with, uh, with JavaScript is it's very hard to reason about where the program is actually defined. There is almost no declarative syntax. And it's, it's, it's very hard, if not impossible, and someti uh, sometimes to find dependencies between different components in, in a language like JavaScript. Um, it's, it's not uncommon and not unheard of that in JavaScript you do monkey patching of, of core functionality, add your methods to the object that prototype. Um, that makes it even harder to reason about what's defined where and who uses what. And understanding the program structure is really, really important if you want to be uh, efficient as a programmer. You need to be able to do code maintenance and refactoring, and that really requires you to have a full and very good understanding of the program structure. You also need that um, understanding of the program structure if you want to write a good tool that can analyze your code and work with it and allow you to debug it and maybe navigate the code in a, in a clever way. 
So it's, it's, it's actually really hard in JavaScript. Let me give you a small example of, of what I mean with that. So here's a very, very simple JavaScript function um, meant as a constructor for points. Um, so the fields of this point class that I'm trying to simulate in JavaScript are not actually declared anywhere, except that they are implicitly sort of defined by the statements that I put in the constructor that assign x and y to this.x and this.y. And um, this seems simple enough and, and pretty nice, and you could, you could probably write a tool that works with this kind of information. But in reality, it's often more complicated than this. So in JavaScript, we often see code like this, for, for instance, where you really want to make these properties uh, non-writable, like read-only. Uh, and suddenly, you have to go through a sort of actual control flow in your constructors to figure out um, what kind of fields you end up having on all your points. Of course, this is a, a trivial example, so a very good tool could probably analyze this code and understand what you're doing. But for real applications, this, this really quickly gets really, really hard. If you look at the tools out there today for working with JavaScript code, uh, it is pretty clear that it's not an easy problem to solve. I mean, there are good tools coming out, and it's improving, but it's really hard. Another very fundamental issue with JavaScript is this um, keep on trucking mentality. So JavaScript has this idea that it's, it's a good thing to tolerate mistakes in the program. And um, it's OK to operate on uh, unexpected types. Uh, and it's OK if that actually just leads to unusable or un unexpected results. So at the point in your code where you introduce an error, you're very unlikely to get that error. Um, and it's much more likely that the value that you get out of that uh, uh, mistake you put in will just flow through your program and end up uh, causing a, a problem later on. So it just makes it very, very hard to find the problem. Almost anything goes. Um, for the program of productivity, it's much better to throw errors more eagerly. Um, so it makes it much easier to locate like, the source of an error. And it, it gives you um, many of the errors at, uh, when you're testing your code, not at runtime at the end user's uh, site. So it gives you more confidence in the deployed apps, too. It, it's, it's really a good thing for writing large-scale applications and, and being able to trust that they actually work as intended. Let me give you a few examples of that. So in JavaScript, uh, constructors for, uh, for objects are just functions. That seems pretty nice and simple. Uh, like we can use the function um, as a constructor, and it, it, it just sort of works. So if we build on the, on the point example from before, um, we can clearly allocate a point by using that as a constructor. Uh, but what happens if we actually forget to write new in front of uh, that constructor invocation? Well, it turns out it works. It doesn't give you an error. It's fine. Um, it does give you the point undefined back. Um, and additionally, it gives you two extra global variables, uh, x and y, that have the value 2 and 3. So you don't get a point, but you get extra state on the global, uh, the global object. That seems unintended, kind of weird, and just is a real source of errors. We see this every day. Um, during the development of V8, we've been through uh, quite a lot of JavaScript code written by many, many people. And, and these sort of subtle bugs always pop up. And one more thing. The interesting part is that uh, undefined in JavaScript, as you see here, you cannot even rely on because it's mutable. You can change that property. So most people that will write correct code in this case will, instead of undefined, use void zero. That makes sense to you, right? Yeah, it does. I don't know how many people that makes sense to, but anyway, let's take another example. This is probably the most common uh, source of, of issues in JavaScript. So if you have a typo in your code, that, leads you to, that gives you real problems, and it's hard to find. So I put some code up here that uses an, an XML HTTP request object. And it, the intent is, of course, to, um, to install a callback that uh, will we'll get invoked whenever the ready state changes. And if we reach the, the done state, which is state 4, uh, we'll log it to the console. Very simple. Unfortunately, this does not work. The console will never have anything here, even if the, uh, the ready state does change to 4, because Ready state is spelled with a capital S. Um, so JavaScript allows this, and it's just fine. It just gives you undefined every single time you try to read the ready state with a lowercase s. And undefined is not equal to 4. Maybe it should be. I don't know. Uh, anyway, it's, it's this kind of thing that makes you less productive as a programmer. And it's, it's, it kind of sucks. If we're sort of continuing on that uh, trend, we can also take a look at implicit conversions. Uh, there have been some pretty funny videos circul circulating the web with, with more examples like this, but this is a very simple one. So here we have a string. Strings in JavaScript are values. They're immutable. You cannot change them. If you try, 
do like string dot hash equals something, it's accepted. What actually happens here is that you actually implicitly convert string to a string object that wraps that string, and you can access properties on that. You can even set properties on that. The only problem is you actually throw that temporary object away just after having done it, so it has no effect. So when you try to assert that string dot hash is something reasonable afterwards, it's undefined. And again, I probably should have put void zero here. Because the next, um, you get a different object wrapped around this string value to, to grab hold of the hash. This is surprising to many people. And often you use, uh, use this kind of trick to try to add some caching to your code. And it seems to work just fine, except that you never get any caching out of it. It's just, it's a performance problem, and it, it's, just, it's just annoying to have to deal with. I think I can top the last slide. How about this one? I don't know if anyone here can tell me why 2.0 should be equal to the string 2 that is equal to a Boolean object that wraps the true value that is equal to the string 1. But it is. There are so many implicit conversions going on here that it makes my head explode. Um, and having to implement this in V8 was, uh, it was a lot of fun. Uh, but sometimes you have to doubt whether or not the, like the value you get out of these implicit conversions is worth the trouble. Actually, if you take the ECMAScript standard and go through the specification, you'll figure out you need at least six implicit conversions of objects before you can evaluate this expression. Yeah, and they go in, in different directions, right? Sometimes you convert to numbers implicitly, sometimes to strings, sometimes from objects to primitive values. It's, it's pretty messy. Another big issue that we see, and this is of course also coming from the sort of the low level from the VM side up, is that JavaScript has really unpredictable performance. There's sort of an advice floating around uh, that you should just try to use the efficient subset of JavaScript. Because VMs over the last few years have been optimized for certain patterns. And if you want to benefit from the performance improvements, um, and you probably do want to do that, um, you have to hit that sweet spot and uh, sort of have your, all your code fit in that efficient subset. The, the problem is that it's actually kind of hard to find that subset. Nobody can tell you what that subset is. It depends on the browser. It depends on the version of the browser. And it's not just about using the right syntactic constructs. It can be about not fetching local variables from the context chain. It can be about many different things. If you see a site like jsperf.com where people try to upload these uh, mini snippets of code to, to figure out what works well in, in certain browsers, this is sort of an act of desperation. Right? People are trying to figure out what works well. They just don't know. So the only way to write a really high performance JavaScript application is to profile all the time. That takes time, again, limiting your productivity. So, you can do amazing things with JavaScript. It's just kind of tricky and time consuming. And JavaScript performance is, is uh, pretty unpredictable. Sometimes it's really great, and sometimes you get like a factor of 20 slower uh, code just by using uh, some slightly less common uh, version of something. That's not a good place to be. All right, so this is the summary for the JavaScript portion. And uh, as Casper stated, Programs are hard to understand when you look at the source code, and it's also hard to reason about if you're a tool. One thing that's really bad in JavaScript is you can monkey patch the basic objects. That means that if you have two different components that rely on the same library, uh, you get into problems, because if one component patches the, the library in a way the other component cannot handle, then your program breaks. So composability is out the window. Keep on trucking mentality is, is just surprising to most. And we have gotten programs in to analyze where this is uh, an error. So programmers actually sent their programs out in production with these keep on trucking errors in them. And then, of course, there's some productivity about uh, uh, the code. You should try to take your favorite fast running JavaScript code and put in delete property on, on, on in, a, uh, in, a, in a crucial place, and then the performance code will go down the toilet. So um, this was the motivational part, and hopefully you can see innovation is needed if you want to move the platform forward so it's more productive for programmers. So let's talk about Dart. And uh, you'll get Dart in one slide. It's here. Here it is. So since we are VM developers, right, we don't really know how to design languages. So we thought a good idea would be to take different languages and take the best aspects of them, and put into one. So Dart is basically a sort of a combination of the syntax from JavaScript, the optional types in Strongtalk, the object model in Smalltalk, 
some concepts uh, from C sharp, um, and then an isolate model that's inspired by Erlang. So that is sort of very simple, and to 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 sort of specify uh, what it is, it's an unsurprising simple object-oriented language with single inheritance. So we have classes, and we have interfaces, and we have a familiar syntax. So if you know how to program in C Sharp or Java or JavaScript, I would expect that you can get productive within a few hours. One thing that, that's worth mentioning here is that at some point we, we found that if you want to develop a language, design it, uh, to make it appealing to people, it has to have curly braces. It is not possible to come up with a mainstream programming language that gets any kind of acceptance without curly braces. So we have tons of curly braces. Yeah. You're welcome. It's sad, but true. Um, so let me just uh, go on. So here's uh, the point example in the uh, in Dart, this is the first uh, Dart example of this talk. And there's a class named point. It has two fields, x and y. Uh, and there's a constructor. And parameters to the constructor is this.x and this.y. It means when you call the constructor, it will assign the parameters to the two fields. So there's no body of the constructor in this case. It also have an operator plus that takes another point, And then it returns a, a new point. Uh, that's actually the addition of the two points, the receiver and the parameter. Here you can see the shorthand notation for, for a function where we use the arrow uh, syntax. It just means that there's one expression to the right and the function will return that exp uh, the result of that expression. There's also a two-string uh, method and it turns uh, a string uh, so you can see what uh, coordinates that point has. Here we're using string interpolation. It's fairly obvious what's going on. And then we have a top-level main that creates a new point. And then it has an expression where we add one point to another point, which is uh, new point 4, 5. One thing I should point out, you cannot call the constructor without new. That's a good thing. Hopefully the syntax does not look too scary to people. I mean, the feedback we've gotten so far is that this kind of code is actually fairly easy for people to just read on a slide and understand. That's exactly what we're going for. When we designed the language, uh, we looked at uh, various attempts to make scalable uh, programs. And there needs to be a way where the progr programmer can sort of specify the intent of a library. And one way of doing that is specifying type annotations. And we have that in Dart. They're optional, though, so you can write without types if you want to. And as your program matures and you get more structure on it, you can add the types any time you want. But they act as sort of checkable, checkable documentation for the code and the interfaces. So you can decide only to put in types in the interface, but you can also decide to really put in static types everywhere in your program. And people that are familiar with Java or C Sharp, they have a tendency to do that. We also have generics, and it makes it really useful so you can specify you have a list of apples or a set of oranges, uh, states intent. The type system is a little bit special in that it's considered unsound because we allow downcast in, uh, when statically checking a Dart program. However, these are validated at runtime, so if you violate uh, the assignment rules, you'll get a runtime error. But it makes it very, very flexible, and I'll show you that on the next slide, hopefully. Or the next slide. This one here is the point example again, where we have added uh, the types. So you can see that uh, the fields are now annotated with none, which is a, a number in Dart. And also the return uh, um, type of the operator plus will be a point. And the parameter to that is also a point. So you can see if you contrast it to the first example, there's little changes you have to make in order to type it. And this, hopefully here, also is very easy to read. We see people start out without writing a, a lot of type notations. Why they're prototyping, just wanted to get some things done, they will write in the style where they have less type notations. And once they want to 
coordinate their work with their coworkers or um, maybe send it out for a code review. They will add more types to try to document what they, they felt like doing um, and what the different constructs were meant to do. Uh, usually we end up having types on interfaces and uh, return types and, and parameters and less types in the implementations of, of methods. But it's, it's sort of a matter of taste and you can choose essentially what you like. So uh, to some of you that are used to generics from, from, from Java or C Sharp, this might sound surprising, but we have query and generic types. And uh, it basically means uh, that a, uh, an apple, if apple is a fruit, then a list of apples is clearly a list of fruits. And here in this example, we have the main function. Uh, it, uh, it calls a pick apples from a tree, and it, and it returns a list of apples. And then you call the print fruits method below, and that takes a list of fruits. And it seems to work, and that's how it should work. But if you take Java or C Sharp, that will fail. Because if you take these two, two generic types in, in these languages, they are unrelated, and the type system cannot cope with it. Hopefully, yeah. it works like you want it to work. That's exactly what I wanted to say. It's, this, it's, this fits with sort of your intuition in most cases. And of course, the, uh, there are some theoretical reasons why other languages have not done this before. Uh, but this actually works pretty well in practice. Um, so it does give you some runtime checks every now and then, but it, it works really well in, in practice. And it, it makes the types not get in your way. All right. So let's go for a small demo. So, uh, you. Was that you? Let me show you just a tiny bit of Dart code and how it works in practice. Uh, and I want to try to illustrate um, how these uh, types can be checked at runtime to give you very rec recognizable and very strong error signals that allow you to, to um, fix issues in your code much quicker. So here's a, an instance of the Dart editor running. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about the, the editor. You should come to the, uh, the, uh, the next talk at 2.45 in room 3. Uh, you'll get much more insights into what the editor can do and how it works. This will just be a small teaser. Um, so here I have a, a Sunflower uh, demo. I can show you that running in our custom build of, of Chrome that has the Dart VM enabled. And, and it's, it's a fairly simple small thing. It just allows me to have a slider and adjust the size of this Sunflower thing. If I go back to the editor and, and, and I deliberately introduce a small issue in the code, let me scroll down here, find the main thing, something like messing up and providing the wrong, like a rubbish argument to a draw frame. Instead of providing the context, I'll give it the canvas instead. I'll save that. And because the VM is enabled in, in this uh, Darium build, I can just go and refresh the browser and it gets the latest source code, no compilation necessary. What actually happens is I, I go back into the editor because this actually gives me an exception because I'm supposed to be passing a canvas rendering context 2D. That's a nice short name. Uh, it wants a context, and I'm giving it a canvas instead. So I get a very rec recognizable error right here when I have, to have the mistake. It doesn't like, try to keep on trucking, uh, and it really helps me as a developer to figure out what I, what I messed up. Um, so this is a, a very small teaser just to show you that the checking uh, of these types at runtime can really help you just find uh, those issues really quickly. Um, and this is a good example where there's a mixture between untyped code and typed code. And the, uh, even though you have a mixture, the typing in the type part will help you validate that you use the code the right way. So the canvas that I provided as, a, as, a, as the argument was untyped. Uh, that's OK to pass something that's expected type, but we will check it. So let's go back to the presentation here. All right. Um, since it's a, a full language, uh, we decided to select a small potpourri of, of cool language features I hope you like. So let's go, go through them quickly. So uh, we have named constructors in, 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 in Dart. And it means that you can have more than one constructor in the same class. In this case here, we have added a named constructor to point. It's called polar. So if you have uh, polar coordinates, you can pass that in and also create a point. The main reason for doing that is we are not, we don't, don't have type overloading uh, in, in Dart, and this will give you a, a flexibility uh, compared to other languages where you often have to do several static 
uh, factory methods to, uh, to get to the same result. So, cool feature. Next, we have interfaces, but what we've also done, we have added something called default implementations to interfaces. And it's mainly, mainly designed so that novice users do not have to know all the implementation types in the system. So all they have to know is the, the simple interfaces, and you can even say new to a list, which is an interface. And the only thing that will happen is it will just delegate the constructor call to the default implementation, and in this case, it's the list factory. So um, we created two lists for you here in main. The first one is just a list without a generic parameter, and in that list, you can add any object you have. The second one is a list of points, and we've even passed the optional parameter uh, length to it, so we'll get a list of uh, 12 elements, and you can only add points to it. So if you look at the, um, the list constructor up in the interface, that square bracket notation means that that parameter is optional. It can be provided by the caller, or it cannot be provided. So. Um, the, uh, the default implementation gets to decide what to do if it's not provided, and in this case, it just initializes the list with zero elements, and you get to add your stuff afterwards. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a nice thing that you can specify in the interface, that the intent is that you can provide this if you want to, or you may not want to do that, and you get the default uh, behavior instead. So that's another language feature on the same slide, like two and one. Next one is cascaded calls. How many of you have used Smalltalk? Wow. Out of That's the five, how many like cascaded scents? Nobody, Nobody likes them. Anyways, we have added cascaded scents. <laughs> I'm a true believer in them. So uh, it basically means we have a construct that allows you to do multiple calls on the same object. Here's an example where you want to draw a circle. You get the canvas, uh, the x and y coordinates, and the size in. And you first uh, compute the, the, the context from the canvas, and then you want to call, uh, do a number of calls on that object, the context. And this is how it's done in Dart. We use the dot-dot notation, and it means that you first call a begin path on the context, then arc, then fill, then close path, and then stroke. It's just a simple way to avoid introducing yet another local variable. It also gives us uh, great typing information. So. If you have canvas.context and that is typed uh, in the definition of the canvas, uh, the system will, will know and be able to give you uh, code completion suggestions when you're doing these, uh, these cascaded things. So it, it helps, uh, at least if it, the alternative was to do like a, a bar declaration and have to go through all the pains of that. So this is shorter and, and nicer in many ways. Here's another thing. Uh, this illustrates how we do proper capturing of loop variables in Dart. Here's a function called main. It has a list. It's called closures. And we have a for loop from 0 to 8 where we add a, a closure uh, each time you execute the loop. And in this uh, case here, it's just a function that returns the variable, uh, the, ca the counter variable i. In most languages, what happens if you execute this code that's specified, uh, by the way, at the end here, we, we go through the list of closures and then evaluate the closure and print the result. If you do that in C Sharp or in JavaScript, you'll get a number of eights out because they're all the closures will refer to the same uh, loop variable. In Dart, it's different. In Dart, we'll inter introduce a new uh, loop variable each time you enter the, the loop. So, in Dart, you'll see the results 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And this is a common mistake when you use closures in, uh, for programming. We have a number of examples from JavaScript again where we see people using like, an asynchronous API, and they have to be very careful to capture the right uh, variables and the right values. Um, so there's a lot of small mistakes in that, and you see a lot of uh, weird things going on with that. So we decided to try to fix that and make it simpler for programmers to reason about this. So um, to us, that is beautiful, even though we took most of the components and curly braces from other languages. Um, it's declarative, so we think it's easy to read, and it's certainly toolable. 
We don't do any implicit conversion, so the semantics is fairly straightforward. And the libraries are actually read-only, so you can have composable component, and it works, and you can rely on it. And again, if you're used to Java, C Sharp, or uh, JavaScript, other languages with curly braces, this should be easy. So the Dart language is, of course, a big part of this, uh, this project, but there is more to it. So let me give you like, a brief tour of, of what we're doing. The language is only part of the story. Um, if you want to have a great web development platform, um, that entire platform has to be uh, well-tuned for helping you guys to deliver fantastic apps. So developers need a great new language, and we've tried to, to argue why Dart is that new language. Uh, but you also need really fast execution and, and uh, really fast startup of applications, and you need very good tools for developing uh, your apps and for analyzing your app. Um, it's also very important that you get very good integration with the, with the DOM. Um, so as developers, you need all of this. So the Dart project is not just about the language. It's also about innovating on the, um, on the, on the tool side. And, to make, and it's also about giving you access to a much better and much more predictable performance. Because we've decided to make Dart run on existing platforms, we have a little bit complicated deployment story for Dart. And I'll try to go through it here. So the green stuff at the top is your application plus libraries. And you have a few choices here. You can run it directly on the Dartium build, which you saw Casper demo before, and it'll run right away. But you can also process the application and library through tools. One tool is the Dart to JS compiler, which will translate Dart into one single JavaScript file, and then you can run it in any modern browser. This is the part where you should be happy if you're not trying to break the web. Another tool we have is we can convert an application plus libraries into a snapshot. And a snapshot is a serialized form of the data structure that makes application startup much faster. I'll get back to that in two slides. This is actually a, a really important point. I think I want to make it again. Lars already said it. Dart is compatible with all modern browsers. So this is just a, a small um, cutout of, of the uh, buildbot that we have running uh, on, on buildbot.dartline.org. And it shows us testing uh, Dart across Firefox, Chrome, Safari, IE, and Opera. Um, and it, this is actually just an indication that we take this compatibility issue very seriously. So it's, it's very dear to our hearts to have Dart running really well across all modern browsers. All the browsers here do not have Dart VMs uh, built in. Uh, so here we're using the, the Dart to JavaScript translation. And we make that work across all these, these browsers. And we continue to do that and, and, uh, and keep that pop running. Let me just spend a few mo moments on, on telling you about the translation process. We do have a compiler that translates Dart to JavaScript. It's written in Dart uh, itself. Uh, that gives us uh, a nice um, excuse for, for using Dart as a language ourselves. And it also means that we can compile Dart, the Dart to JS compiler with itself and get a compiler out that actually can compile Dart to JavaScript that runs in any modern browser. That's maybe kind of freaky, but it works really well that you can have a JavaScript implementation of a Dart to JavaScript compiler by just compiling it with itself. I like that stuff. Maybe it'll go too reflective now. Um, so let's, let's get back to something uh, more down to earth. Here's a, a, I think at this point, very well-known example, the point with two, uh, uh, two fields, x and y, and a constructor and a two-string. And it translates to something like this on the JavaScript side. That's the right-hand side. We create a structure, give it a name point, and we, we, uh, we fill in uh, an explicit superclass, object in this case, and put in a couple of fields, x and y. Um, and then we have a small piece of code that actually translates this to a JavaScript constructor at runtime and puts in the getters and setters for these fields and makes it, makes it nice to work with. But the rest of the definition of point is actually just the methods. So here you see the toString method is being translated to a JavaScript toString method with a dollar zero at the end. That just means that that function expects zero arguments. It's important for us to, uh, to make sure that uh, the functions that you call get the expected number of arguments so you don't have this uh, classical issue in JavaScript where you forget to provide a parameter and just kind of works in a weird way. The two-string method on, on the right is a bit more verbose than the one on the 
in the left, and that's because of the string interpolation feature, where we will make it very, very easy to uh, convert um, uh, strings and uh, bits and pieces of, of expressions and code to, uh, to uh, sort of join them as, as strings. And you see here it's translated into uh, a couple of string concatenation operations. So we'll do this for you, and this, this code runs across all modern browsers. We have to speed up a little bit, I think. Anyways, one cool thing about Dart is that because it is declarative, we can do something called tree shaking. And tree shaking is this pre-deployment step that allows you to reduce the size of the executable. And what it basically means is that you take the main function and you start shaking it. Everything that you're not using will fall off the tree, and when you're done, you can wrap it up, and that's your application. So unused classes and unused methods will be eliminated, and the application is just penalized for what it's using at, compared to what's being included in libraries. And this is great because it helps the download time of the application, and it also helps the startup time. It also means that you can depend on a big library and you only, you only pay for the small pieces of it you actually use, so. You cannot do that in JavaScript. Why? Well, because there's a val. Val is a thing that takes a string and converts it into code. So you cannot analyze it statically. The second one is it, it also has like the with statement that introduces voodoo scoping. You basically have no chance of figuring out what's being accessed in your outer scope. So that's much easier in Dart and that that is what clear semantics will give you. Treeshaking is already used by Dart to JS today, and clearly it reduces the, uh, uh, the size of the app and also improves startup. We are in the process of also working on a tool that takes Dart code, tree shakes it, and emits Dart code. So the Dart code itself will be easier to start up. And that'll be based on the same infrastructure as the Dart to JS compiler. Shaken, not stirred. That's the motto. Yes, James. Another thing that should be really cool, and is already implemented in, in, in the Dart VM, and that's the Dart snapshots. And it's a binary form of the entire Dart application. And our measurement so far means that it's, you get a 10 times speed up compared to sourcing in the application before starting up. And that's fantastic, because that means that instead of having a one second startup, you get down below 100 milliseconds when you start up the application. And it's very simple. If you do the VM the right way, you can just load in the application into the heap, and then you serialize the heap uh, into a binary format. Very simple. And it's really, really efficient when you start up again. What, you, what benefits you is you don't have to do scanning and parsing of the source code. Um, and also on mobile devices, you don't have to spend as much uh, uh, CPU resources in loading in the application because it's just a matter of ser uh, deserializing the, uh, the heap. All right. It's important to notice that this binary form is, is completely platform independent. It's the same thing you would ship to a mobile device as you would ship to the desktop, even if it's like a 64-bit and a 32-bit machine in involved. It's the same format. So it's not about doing like a per-target compilation of any sort. This is just a binary form of the source code, essentially. It doesn't contain any uh, generated code. Yeah and it can handle going from a 32-bit machine to a 30, to, to, from a 32-bit machine to a 64-bit machine if you, if you want to do that. All right, now let's talk about the future. One important part of this project is to design a new programming language, and we are pretty much done with that design process. We have a, sp uh, a formal specification uh, made. You can download it and read it if you want to, with a few exceptions. We have a few things we will put in. One is we will probably in eliminate interfaces because we also have abstract classes and they work exactly the same way. So this will just simplify the language. We'll also introduce, introduce mix-ins that allows you to do co-sharing across inheritance hierarchies but that'll come in after version one of, of, of Dart. And then, of course, we'll have a, some support for annotations because most IDEs, they want annotations. Java pro programmers want annotations. So that's how it is. But anyway, you should look at the specification. It's pretty much done. 
and I hope you like it. Otherwise, send us comments. So this is our timeline we have on the whiteboard uh, in Denmark. So the, as you can tell, up to 2009, we were busy hacking on JavaScript, making that, that faster. And at some point, uh, Lars and I decided to, uh, to try to do something a bit simpler than that. We called that Spot, and that was in 2010. And um, we spent like three months on, on hacking up this new virtual machine, a new programming language, and a new set of libraries. Uh, and that was a lot of fun. Uh, at some point, it was so promising that we decided to turn it into uh, like a real project. And uh, it got rebranded to Dart, and that's, the, um, that's where we're at now. So in 2011, we introduced Dart um, and, uh, as a technolo technology preview. And we've been got getting a, a lot of very good feedback from, uh, from that, that process. So this year, it's all about making Dart robust and really, really fast. And next year? Success. That's what we'll do. So um, what we're working on hard today is to make sure that you have a developer release in your hands later this year so you can start relying on the libraries, the performance of Dart, and building application on top of it. And the, uh, the release will include the language fixed, hopefully, for the first version. Mm -hmm. Uh, libraries for the web and server development, so you can also write Dart applications on the server side. We have a programming environment, so some of it is based on uh, Eclipse. Mm -hmm. And we also have a, a standalone virtual machine that's also been integrated into the Chromium build. And that was the Dartium browser you saw uh, in the demo. And then we have this translation to JavaScript uh, that allows us to be compatible with most browsers. So this is exciting. So in addition to all that, Dart is already now and will remain a fully open source product here. Uh, Dart is available under a, a very permissive uh, BSD license. So if you want to take it, and run with it, use it for something, have fun. Um, the entire idea is to try to foster innovation in this space. So it makes a lot of sense for us to just put all the bits and pieces out there and, uh, and have a, a community based, based around that. So it's developed in the open. All our code reviews are on public mailing lists, and all the build bots are for everybody to see. And uh, it makes it much easier for us to interact with, uh, with members of the community that have uh, good ideas or, or good feedback. Already now, we have a, a, a fairly active community. And we're getting a lot of, of, of very helpful and very good feedback on like, new ideas that we circulate on, on the mailing list. So if you're interested in, in, uh, in joining in or at least trying it out, you should uh, go to some of the online resources that we have available. And the primary site is dartlang.org, and uh, there you'll find a lot of information about how to, to download the SDK and the editor and, and try it out. So please try it out and, uh, and continue to give us good feedback. Uh, one interesting note is that since we released it uh, as a preview uh, last fall, we have uh, added a few changes to that platform. There's now 9,000 revisions since last fall. So you can imagine that there's a lot of change lists coming out every day. And we're very serious about making this uh, fast and consistent. It's fun to work on a, on a project like that that moves really quickly. And it's fun to see people that use it uh, being excited about the new changes and, and adapting their existing code bases to, to new interesting things that, that pop up in the language. So it's been a fun process. So there's even more uh, about Dart at this, this Google I.O. So this was a very sort of a high level uh, presentation about Dart and the motivation behind it. Um, if you're interested in, in more details, I suggest you go to the, uh, to the next talk at 2.45 in room three, which is about uh, building web apps in, in Dart. And you'll get more sort of hands-on experience with what it is to build something new and exciting in Dart. There's also a talk about migrating code that's written in GWT to Dart uh, in the same, same room, room three. Um, and during the entire afternoon here, from, from now essentially uh, to, uh, to fairly late, we have Dart office hours on the Chrome demo floor. So if you want to uh, come chat with us there, uh, feel free to drop by. And if you have questions, we'll be very happy to try to, to answer them. Uh, tomorrow, if, if you feel really darty, you should go to our, uh, our Bullseye, your first Dart app code lab, where you'll get a chance to do some, some hands-on work with, with the environment and, and, the, uh, and the product. And we are pretty much at the end now. So this is a summary slide. Uh, I hope we managed to convince you that Dart is a simple and unsurprising object-oriented language that should be easy to use. And it allows 
you to write structured code and also develop tools that can analyze this, these programs. And it works on modern browsers. So we've had a lot of experience in implementing virtual machines for various object-oriented languages. This is the first time we are doing a new language, and it's, uh, it's a challenge, but it's fun. Mm -hmm. So thank you for listening, and if you have any questions, please line up in front of the mics uh, so we can capture what you're asking. Yeah, the, the final thing here is to, to uh, just make a mental note of the fact that it's fairly easy to build a, a really high-performance, fast virtual machine, at least compared to building a new language. So we're having a lot of fun. Hello? Yeah. Yes. Hey, um, is it the same JavaScript that it's cross-browser, or is it do you have different versions for your different browsers? So we, we generate one version of the JavaScript code, um, and there are some parts in there that are browser-specific, but right now we just compile one version that deals with all the differences in, in one file. Um, so one output, one JavaScript file that works across all the modern browsers. Um, one other question. Um, when you, when uh, you've, you've just, You've shown us the language, but the APIs that you use to access the DOM and the other elements of the browser, um, are those f familiar? They're the same, right? So we have, um, we're using the same DOM interface as JavaScript, except uh, a few changes to make it more consistent, and we call it the, uh, the Dart HTML library. So it's also available when you download Dart. If you go to the next talk about that, you'll see how that's being used uh, for building web applications. But this, was, this talk was mostly about the language and not how to hook it up to the web. If you drop by the, uh, the, uh, the Chrome demo flow, I'm sure someone can, can show you what it is and how it looks at, at the API level. Yeah. I had a question. I had a question, I guess, more about the Dart editor, but um, I've played with it a little bit, and I was wondering if there's plans to make like an official Eclipse plugin so that we can get all the version control and other features of the Eclipse platform. There's been a lot of requests to get uh, a plugin, and behind the scenes, uh, it's sort of the same. So we will wrap it up at some point. Uh, I cannot give you a date when it's there, but, but it'll, it's, it will come. Thanks. Take one more here, and then we'll switch that side for a while. Oh. Uh, yeah, sorry. So, what sort of integration, or is there any integration with uh, like Google Closure compiler for JavaScript? Like, do you guys pump out minified, optimized JavaScript, or is it just you know unminified? Then you pump it through Closure afterwards. So, right now, what we're doing is um, we're generating um, unminified but optimized output, um, and we're pushing hard on making those optimizations even better. And we are working on on minification as well. So we don't have any uh, immediate plans of using the Clojure compiler for doing this, uh, because sometimes we actually lose a lot of information when you go from, from Dart input to JavaScript with type annotations in, in, uh, in common. So we want to try to avoid losing that kind of information and, and essentially do the minification and optimizations ourselves based on the fact that we understand the Dart semantics even better than the Clojure compiler can. Minification is actually very simple when you have all the information from the, uh, the, the compiler. So uh, it's probably much easier to do it ourselves than go through the, the closure compiler for minification. We also have a need for minifying Dart code to make the, the download of Dart code smaller. So we, we will produce something like a Dart to Dart translator that minifies and optimizes. So cool. And just one other quick question. Is there any ability to, like, uh, at runtime import additional code, to load in additional code if you're using binaries? Or is it all done at compile time only? Actually, we use this, uh, this concept that we actually didn't introduce much here, is, the, is isolates. And that's one way of, of creating a completely new world that you can, you can uh, populate with, with new dynamically loaded code. And it's still work in progress. It's something that we uh, will be pushing more on. There's also a, another way of uh, dynamically loading code. We have a way of uh, lazy loading an entire library. So when you say import to a library, you can say it should be lazy load. Okay. Load it, and you just have to activate the, uh, the loading, and you cannot use the entry point to that library before it has been completely loaded. If you try to use it, it throws an exception. Okay, cool. Thanks. I just have a question. 
What yeah. is your recipe for server farm? So Dart is um, on the client side sort of language, but uh, what, um, how do you envision the communication between server and client? So certainly we support uh, JSON, so you can use the JSON format to move stuff back and forth. Uh, the, uh, the language uh, is not a client language, it's also a server language. And we have a standalone VM you can run on the server side. And it has an IO library that supports uh, uh, like Node.js, a uh, asynchronous way of doing IO. Uh, so you can write server code uh, in Dart if you want to. There's, there's some work going on with, uh, uh, with using something like protobufs to yeah. compu communicate between client and server. Uh, but there's a lot of community interest in this area too. So it is very important to stress that Dart runs just fine on the server. So you can write your code, the client code and the server code in the same language and have that uh, interoperate in a nice way. Yeah. Okay. Does, does Dart support compile time evaluation so that I will be able to calculate optimal parameters before generating the code. A good example of the use of that is being uh, articulated in Andres Alexandrescu book about the deep programming language. So we have, a, we have some support for that. It's not completely general, but it's, it's very simple and, and works well. And that's in the form of uh, what we call compile time expressions. Uh, where you, there's a subset of the language essentially that you can use to, for, for building compile time expressions. And there, that includes user defined data structures. We call them const objects that are actually uh, built at compile time rather than at runtime. So there is some support in the language there. I, I, you should drop by the uh, demo floor and uh, I can show you how it works. So, for instance, in the point example, if you make the fields final, you can make a const constructor for the point, and uh, so you can make instances of point as compile time expressions that are compiled at compile time. I definitely would like to drop to the down floor. Good. Good. Uh, so, uh, what did you mean by success for the 2013? Um, that we still have a job working on Dart. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, that was a joke. Um, success means that um, in 2013, we have a, a stable system that's out in, uh, in Chrome, and we have many uh, sort of real projects outside Google also working on Dart um, and using uh, Dart for deploying code. This is the ultimate goal. We hope, so our, the premise here is to make sure that programmers uh, will get a much better platform for writing applications. And uh, if you cannot demonstrate that, that's certainly a failure. <laughs> so do you expect like any other browsers is going to, you know, yes. that able, or like, since it's, can be comp it's already compatible for the, you know, most of JavaScript yeah. stuff, that's okay? Yeah. Or? So uh, your question is, will the other browser vendors take the Dart VM and integrate it into their browsers? Well, I cannot answer that since I'm not controlling what they're doing. But what I can do is I can make sure that that is an appealing offering, right? So it's, it's uh, out there, it's open source, and if we can demonstrate Dart applications when running with a native VM has instant startup and better performance than a similar sort of JavaScript program, it, is seems, it seems very appealing to me if I was sitting in the other camp uh, and then integrated. Thank you. And we hope that will happen, of course. Um, I'm curious if all of the Dart language features compile to JavaScript, and I'm specifically curious about covariant generics. So, yeah, um, so covariant generics are, are reasonably easy to compile to JavaScript. There's nothing in JavaScript that hinders that. There's one area where, um, where it's problematic to, uh, to have like, the full Dart language implemented um, when translated to JavaScript, and that's numerics. JavaScript does not have any efficient way of having arbitrary sized integers, for instance. Uh, everything is and comes to numbers, a double in JavaScript. So there are some restrictions on how numbers work in, in Dart when compiled to JavaScript compared to what you get on the native VM. It's, it's a hard problem to solve. We're looking at, at, at sort of ways of doing that. But for now, that's the one area where there's, there's a real difference between the two setups. We have discussed caving in and just having numbers like in JavaScript. But boy, we really like integers and the semantics of integers and mixing them all up, I think, is a mistake. So that's the reason why, precisely in this area, 
there's a little bit of discrepancy between the native implementation and uh, the JavaScript uh, Great, generated you. code. Yes? Is uh, Google going to promote uh, Dart over GWT down the road? Uh, DWT uh, already has a lot of customers and uh, it's still supported. Uh, we think, since we have done the Dart part and have nothing to do with the grid part, that this is a better fit for the web platform. And uh, during the presentation, we were talking about uh, this uh, importance of immediacy when doing programming. The fact that you can change the file and get it up running right away, where there's no tool chain in between you and, and debugging the program. This is something that's hard to do in, in Grid, uh, where it's much, mo uh, much easier to do in, uh, in Dart. At the same time, you can die, you can avoid the types. So if you prototype, you can do crazy stuff and don't think about the types, it'll still work. And I think that uh, really will help you accelerate your uh, prototyping of your application. Also, uh, I was just curious, curious about, uh, for a project of similar size, uh, how does a, uh, a Dart stack up against uh, GWT in terms of uh, code generation, generated uh, JavaScript, <coughs> JavaScript code? Uh, does it, uh, is it uh, smaller in size or larger in size? Um, I think we need to, I don't have comparable numbers right now. What I can tell you is that the generated uh, JavaScript code from Dart is fairly minimal now. You should try it out. Um, and uh, we expect it to be much smaller than what the grid can generate. I think the, the, the grid, system, grid system is also doing a lot of tree shaking before they generate uh, JavaScript uh, code. Uh, but they have so, some sort of, they have a lot of legacy stuff related to the, the Java libraries they're using. But uh, I don't have numbers right now, so go, go home and measure it. Uh, yes. Thank you. Hi. This will uh, be the last question, by the way. Uh, two questions. Um, so first, uh, the syntax for Im importing a module is pound import. Does that, do you have like some sort of preprocessor that you can use with like if defs and stuff? No. Is it, okay. But it, it is true that right, right now the way to write an import is using a, like a pound import. Uh, it is to try to make it stick out, and it certainly does. Uh, <laughs> and we are thinking about making it look more like an integrated part of the language rather than a pre-processing thing. Uh, but it was designed to make it stick out, and it, it does. Uh, secondly, uh, for isolates, are they, impl imp are they implemented as uh, threads, or is it somehow a thin thread? Um. Since we translate to JavaScript and it has to run on top of uh, a single JavaScript engine, right? We have to multiplex between them, but you can run isolates. Uh, but in the in the Dart VM itself? Yes, they're running completely independent, so you can have isolates running in parallel. So they they are actual threads. They don't have yes. to be full well, native threads. There is a thread pool implementation yeah. that we're working on, where I mean, essentially, you'll get as many threads running as you need to. With the, with the, the sort of amount of parallelism you have in your program, so it, it's not tied to one thread, and it's more like a thin threading model. Uh, so, for instance, if the isolate is not active, it doesn't have to have a th native thread bound to it. Does it have a pre-allocated execution stack, a fixed fixed size stack? No. So everything is asynchronous. There is no blocking, so you actually don't need to, to do that. You just have to return from your isolate. I, mean, I see. At that point, okay. so it is an asynchronous model. So there are no execution stack stuck on native threads or anything. So it's very simple that way. So we are using the native execution stack when executing an isolate. Thanks for staying to right. the uh, Q&A. We're, uh, we're done. Thank Talk you.